Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Necromaniacs Horror Podcast, coming at you on Necro Thursday. How's it going, Mike? It is going well. Uh, you got Mike this time, listeners. Mike Scandato. I'm back. Uh, it's going good, man. You know, July is is in full swing. It's hot as hell here in the New York, New Jersey area. And, uh, you know, taking it taking it one day at a time, man. How how you doing, Mike? Oh, uh, you know, busy. Like, I, I moved, basically, you know, like mm-hmm. over the 4th of July weekend. So most of that weekend was de- devoted to moving, driving a truck, and unpacking stuff. And uh, as you guys know, that'll be an ongoing thing for the next several weeks, probably, if not months, <laughs> you know, when, once you move, you know. I tell you, I, I haven't moved since 2021. I fucking hate moving, so my my sympathies. But uh, the good thing about moving is when it's done, you feel very good, right? Like when, yeah. when, when everything is done, you feel much better, you know? And uh, that, that's the upside of moving. The downside of moving is, of course, well, everything else, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, and, yeah, our place is cool. It's like, you know way more spacious than any actually any place i've lived in my life to be honest right now that's great yeah and uh yeah it's 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 nice setting everything up i got the office set up here working doing you know i did a podcast with ralph over the weekend and Mm. this this is the first necro i'm doing with you so i'm in this in this location and um yeah just getting everything situated you know i got cool lighting going on in here you know and Mm -hmm. yeah it's uh it should be it should be good you know Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I had I had a good July 4th weekend. Stella and I went to uh, my buddy uh, Hank uh, from uh, Inhumans uh, annual 4th of July bash, which is always a good time. Um, You know, I feel like, you know, growing up in Brooklyn and stuff with the fireworks, there was a very long period of time where the fireworks had kind of dissipated. Okay, but man, oh, man, are they back? with a bang, so to speak. Uh, the fireworks in Brooklyn are now like old school, out of control, dangerous level again, Mike Hill. Yeah, that, that's what it's like out here in Jersey, actually, where, <laughs> where, where we live now. It's like explosions yeah. on the 4th of July. Yeah, it's like a war. It's, I mean, in the 80s and 90s, it was kind of like a war. By, like, by, by the mid-90s, I think Giuliani really clamped down on fireworks because fireworks are illegal in New York. And they're still illegal in New York. Um, but you know, there was, again, this long kind of lull where 4th of July's were were rather quiet, but as the years have passed, I think leading up to this year, it's just like old school, you know, let's burn the block down 4th of July. (laughs) And that's kind of what was going on in uh, South Brooklyn and in Marine Park and Bay Ridge, Diker Heights, Bensonhurst. Yeah. People were just losing their effing mind. So I guess that's kind of fun. Yeah, it was pretty pretty intense out here in Linden. Um, <laughs> it was like uh, just it just started, and for like two hours, it was like there was a battle going on of just like explosions and rapid fire mm. fireworks and all that stuff. Uh, we actually went out to this really cool Mexican restaurant, uh, just mm-hmm. like literally like walking distance from here, and they have like uh, the mariachis there. It's like nice, sick, sick Mexican <laughs> food prepared by a guy who's into fine dining like he's a, a mm. the chef the she's a chef the guy who makes the food there is like someone with fine dining experience so it's like legit mexican food but like mm. with like that, that kind of upscale like twist to it you know and uh you know it, it, it was like a typical joint though it had like the soccer game playing on these big screens like you know it, it just had a cool vibe it was painted really nice inside a lot of like you know uh skulls like those kind of mexican skulls and you know, yeah yeah i like that, that stuff um it's funny we ate at a mexican restaurant in bay ridge called blue agave uh for the first time and it was it was really good uh we'll definitely be back there um and uh yeah that's i mean look i i try to eat mexican food like every three weeks every four weeks <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm a fan you know oh yeah we're both yeah. fans Stella and i yeah, definitely, man. That's some of the finest dining there is, man. If you ask me, Mexican food. Mm, yeah, yeah. And uh, Saturday, but, uh, my uh, my drummer uh, Justin, it was his birth. Well, his birthday wasn't Saturday, but his wife mm-hmm. staged a surprise party for him down in uh, Highland, New Jersey, down in the uh, that's down on the shore there. And uh, 
So we showed up for that. And the funny thing about that, the reason why I'm mentioning it, is that there was a blackout <laughs> the night the night of his uh, surprise birthday party. So down, you know, I guess all the uh, electrical surge because of the air conditioning blew out the infrastructure down there. So we're all waiting in this place called the Driftwood, just in complete. There's n- no refrigeration, no lights, no ATM Ooh. machine, nothing like that. It's just like, like a bunch of us were down there, like some some of his family and like a, a bunch of sandwiches, and that was it. And then he showed up, and they had uh, the power. Eventually, it went back on, and it, but it was mm-hmm. a fun time, man. It was a fun time to uh, to hang with everyone. It's been a minute That's since cool, I've seen man. all these guys together in one spot, so it was pretty cool. That's nice. Yeah, um, you know, knock on wood that uh, I, I, there aren't any blackouts here because uh, it could totally happen. I mean, everybody's just pumping the AC especially in this past week, you know, could, could definitely shut down the hood. Um, oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, my apartment's a little on the hot side. I only have one air conditioner. So, you know, it is what it is. But it's good. I think I'm losing weight, actually. So that's nice, you know. Right it's on, a, I'm, I'm sweating it out. It's good. Yeah, totally. So let's but give yeah, our, uh, our shouts. Good. Let's give our propers to the uh, mm-hmm. horseman here before we get too far yeah, let's into do this. It. Yeah. So, as everyone knows, we're a member of an elite gang of content creators called the Horsemen of the Podcast Apocalypse. And uh, kicking things off, every other Monday, we've got Brandon Legion's six six six. What's up next, Mike? Uh, on Tuesday, the greatest metal podcast in the land. Uh, I did the news segment the other week. Hello. Hopefully you all, you know, check that one out. Uh, I had some things to say about a band that a bunch of you guys like, that apparently I didn't like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, why I'm referring to Into the Necrosphere with uh, the the lovely and talented Jackie Smith. Make sure you subscribe to Into the Necrosphere. Yeah, I was a bit of a tough cookie that episode, huh? Yeah, dude, I... Um... I, I was kind of surprised you didn't like Eclipse, man. I, I'm I'm actually a pretty pretty big fan of that that band, but you know, to each his own. Everyone's got their own taste. I gotta, yeah, I gotta, I gotta fuck with them a little more, you know. Um, it's weird. Like I think some some of that just really long song black metal, like the the long build up droning kind of black metal, doesn't really always grab me. I gotta say, you know, I, it's funny. I think I've just made up a subgenre long song black metal yeah. um and that's 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 what they are they're long song black metal um yeah it can be a little, a little you know hit or miss for me but I, I will give them another shot because i am definitely in the minority because a, a lot of people like them on the, the the revelation of doom uh message board that i'm on which it has people of you know of course very taste but uh, a, a lot of people on it are are are, are very into, into black metal and death metal, of course. Uh, they've got a bunch of fans on there. So, yeah, I mean, uh, perhaps uh, it hit me at an off day, Mr. Hill. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been backing them for a while. Um, you know, to me, it's like they're more like sort of like in the vein of like maybe Emperor mm-hmm. uh, in the Night's Side Eclipse era. That's kind of what grabbed me first about them with like maybe this kind of neurosis sort of like trippy vibe to it, you know. Mm. Yeah, I mean it's it's got. I hear that neurosis stuff. I definitely hear that. You know. Yeah. Um, I need to maybe hear it a little more to catch some of that that emperor vibe. You know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, a lot of good stuff out there. A lot of good bands. You know. Uh, on Wednesday, folks, we have none other than Mike Hill's podcast. Everything went black, right, Mike? That's right. And, you know, you kind of uh, roll the dice every week. <laughs> Everything went black. Um, mm. It could be pretty much uh, anything. You know, as a matter of fact, Ralph and I did an episode on love, you know, which uh, you got, which came out yesterday. And uh, oh, boy. Yeah, really? So be, oh, yeah, dude. We've been doing every now and then Ralph and I get together and we do these like uh, metaphysics of whatever death, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, all that kind of stuff. And Ralph pitched the idea, do you want about love? Because, you know, that's like something that there's a lot of uh, love songs out there. You know, so mm. we gave our uh, philosophical um, sort of approach to it. You know, everything has more of like a 
a philosophical bent to it on the on that sub show that we do. So it's interesting. Got it. yeah. Okay, I, I, that sounds very interesting. Yeah. Uh, on Thursday, why you're listening to it now? Perhaps the Necromaniacs podcast. Uh, the very best in horror coming to you every damn Thursday with uh, my kill myself, Mike Scandato, and of course. Texas's own Jeff Kashid, right, Mike? Te Texas Jeff. Texas Jeff, of course. <laughs> Texas Jeff. I like it. Yeah. Uh, he might like that nickname. He might. Um, yeah, that's what you should be listening to on Thursday. Uh, on Friday, you should be listening to my very own brother John's podcast, uh, Spitball Media. Uh, it's funny. John wanted me to, to mention that he is a very big fan of uh, the film we'll be covering tonight. Oh yeah. And that of all the uh, universal monsters, this is, this is his hands down favorite. But of course I didn't give away our, our topic just yet. I just said universal monster. So, but uh, Saturday you got the day off. Uh, Sunday you have Carl Hikara's very own soul Knox podcast, which can also make appearances on Thursday. If I'm not mistaken. That's correct. He, he puts yes. out, Typically puts out uh, episodes Thursdays and Sundays, and Carl and I are are full bore into our collaboration, Darkness Weaves, which is uh, our exploration of the work of Carl Edward Wagner, the author of Kane, probably his most notable. I wouldn't say famous because it's not really a household word like Conan, a household name like Conan, but Kane is probably his most well known character. And uh, if we're into like dark fantasy, dark sword and sorcery. That character is definitely for you. It's like in the vein of Conan, but with a little bit more magic thrown in there, mm. black magic, that sort of thing. And um, and also he uh, he writes a lot of uh, weird fiction and and horror stuff too. So um, it's kind of an all around like sick author. Very cool. Yeah. Speaking of books, I'm kind of like piling up on, on the, the 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 comics. I got a bunch of Ghost Rider comics from the early '90s. Remember that oh, Ghost right. Rider oh, run yeah. that started in like '89 and went into about, I guess, the mid '90s. I got a bunch of those in the mail for a very nice price. Uh, been you know stocking up on my late '80s, early '90s Amazing Spider-Man. Some of which go for a lot of money, but I'm you know I'm not getting too crazy. You know I'm, I'm getting the affordable ones. Um, and also, okay, Brian Boland, a uh, famous artist who did tons of work with like DC in the 90s. I, I fucking love his shit. He, he might be most famous, perhaps, for Batman's uh, The Killing Joke, of course, where yep, the Joker yeah. shoots and paralyzes Barbara Gordon and assaults her. And, and it's, it's a great story, The Killing Joke. Um, turns out, I actually forgot. I have not only do I have the original Killing Joke signed by Brian Boland, like the 1988 one, the Prestige one. I actually have the reissued hardcover signed by him as well in my collection. And I kind of, you know, you, sometimes you get these things and years pass and you forget about them. Um, back in the 90s, he did the covers for Wonder Woman and he did this incredible run of artwork for Wonder Woman. And I, I always really liked it. And those actually aren't really that much money. So I've been getting a bunch of those back issues as well. They're good reads. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, I've got a bit of 90s nostalgia going with my comics, Mike. Oh, yeah, definitely. Didn't uh, Brian Boland do uh, Camelot 2000? Yes. Ca yes, he sure did. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a good trade if you guys want to catch up on something like that. Really, really yeah, cool. Yeah. Uh, great artist. Of course, a Brit, one of the many, you know, Brits who kind of, ruled the industry in the 80s and 90s, you know, with Neil Gaiman and Alan Moore and, you know, Garth, you know, Garth Ennis, although Garth Ennis is, uh, is Irish, I believe, not a Brit, right? Or, don't, don't, let, uh, don't let him hear you uh, call him an Irish. Well, that's right. Brit. I don't think he's a Brit, right, actually. That's right. Or <laughs> someone, someone might keep me honest. He might not even be Irish either. So anyway, uh, but you know what I'm talking about, folks, the whole kind of vertigo uh, British explosion, of course, of some of the greatest comics of all time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I even I even dug out these two Neil Gaiman books that I got signed when I met him at some Brooklyn book fair years ago. He drew a, a Sandman sketch oh, man, unasked cool. for me inside of this fucking book that I had. It was, that was a really fucking cool moment in my life. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm finding a lot of like, you know, joy in kind of revisiting, uh, like old comics and stuff and shit like that. You know, I, I, I think it's probably because I've cut down on the music a lot, basically, <laughs> because of the tinnitus. So it's like, hey, you know, I also love something else quite a bit. I love comics, and it's just, you know, made this kind of, you know, momentary trade off. You know. Yeah, my um, my young cousin who was a huge horror fan. I turned her on to Sandman a, a couple of years ago. I started her out oh, off wow. with the trades. Yeah, and she's like, uh, yeah, I think she's like, what, like 12 or 13? Yeah. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, she, out of the blue, she just started becoming obsessed with horror. You know, Very so like, and, and her, you know, she's she's like basically one of us. You know, <laughs> she likes all the same stuff that we do. And uh so she's you know she loves comics too. She's into like uh you know like Harley Quinn and you know Harley Quinn and um mm. you know that the Joker and Batman and that kind of thing. So I I gave her um the first two trades of the Sandman collections, you know, the collected mm -hmm. uh trade paperbacks, and she's been into yeah. that too. So that's cool. Yeah, I'm trying to have every single issue of Sandman. I think there's about 10 or 12 random numbers that I don't have. So got to complete that and i have i think the first six trades or the first five trades there's a couple i'm missing i mean i've read everything yeah but there's just some some things that i i don't have i mean i enjoyed the shit out of the netflix show looking forward to uh yeah. Oh, yeah. season two of the netflix show and you know uh love neil gaiman but uh yeah that, that's kind of what i've what i've been all about lately uh reading stuff <laughs> yeah and then, of course, our, our newest member lurking out there in the shadows is uh, Iblis Manifestations, brought to you by Cheyenne of uh, the incredible black metal band Tribax. That's right. Yeah. Well, there you have it, folks. The, yeah. the horsemen of the podcasting apocalypse. Make sure you subscribe to all of these fine fellows. And, of course, make sure you're subscribing to the podcast you're listening to now, the Necromaniacs podcast. We have uh, some phone calls, Mike, right? That's right. Before that, though, I just want to make an announcement that tomorrow night, I am going to see Long Legs in the movie theater on a 30, 30, yeah, 35 millimeter for you know showing mm -hmm. in Philadelphia at the Philadelphia Film Society with my fiance Tina. Mm -hmm. And none, none other than the, our quality control manager, Rennie. All right. Tell so Rennie I said what's up. Yep. The three uh, of us yeah, are going to be going to check that to, out. Uh, yeah, I'm going to see this one in the theater. Um, I got to see it. Uh, the trailers look insane. The word of mouth looks insane. And it's funny. Uh, something John Draper from uh, the Spitball Media podcast had said that the well, like the first half of 2024 for horror was kind of dead in the water. It mm. seems like from now on, like all of the guns are out, you know, yeah, and all oh, yeah. the guns are kind of coming out with like Maxine and Long Legs, and then later in the year we'll have Terrifier, and later yeah. in the year we'll have uh, Nosferatu, Thanksgiving, uh, and there's a bunch of other stuff coming. We'll have a movie only I will like called Smile 2, I believe, later this year. <laughs> um, there's a bunch of shit from, I would say, July into December. Whereas I feel like the biggest splash pre-July might have been Late Night with the Devil, Mike. You know, I, I, I think there's been some decent stuff that came out in the first half of the year. But the second half is definitely, there's more more heavy hitters. Definitely, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Definitely, right? Yeah, seems that way. Yeah. Um, there, you know, there's something else too, and another kind of big buzzy one that's kind of, of course, slipped out of my head that's coming. Um, but yeah, uh, there's a lot to kind of get excited about for the rest of 2024. Um, I just wanted to touch a little bit on on Maxine, a movie I have not seen yet. It's getting a lot of bad word of mouth, Mike. Have you really? been seeing that? I haven't yeah. because the I you know frankly like I was telling you the last the last several days I've been kind of just you know hmm. a little detached from everything just because of the move and I pretty much uh for, didn't even realize that the movie was out until like yesterday to be honest so okay Got so it. I haven't really caught up on anything but you know what I think this week we're gonna do a double dip into the theater and mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure we're I think the plan is to go check out um 
Maxine on Friday night, actually. Let's see how I'll 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 tell you guys my thumbs okay. up or thumbs down on it. Yeah, it's like it's a movie that I thought was gonna get this universal fucking love hug from the horror community. But if as I looked on Facebook and Instagram and here and there, it, that's not really the case. Um, so again, I haven't seen the movie. So that's I can't say anything else other than the fact that it's getting some thumbs down more. It's getting more thumbs downs than I thought it would. Really, but w w it will be covered on the show, folks. So, oh yeah, kind of high water. Um, and it, it is a movie that I am going to see. So, and Mike is, and I'm sure if Jeff hasn't seen it already, he'll see it. So, yeah, no, you got to complete the trilogy with that one for sure. Yeah, I saw Martin Scorsese gave it some some nice props. Uh, oh, it's talking okay. about how much he liked all three of the movies. So. Oh. That that's cool. Um, well, there you, there you go. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I I you know I hate to to naysay anything I haven't seen, but I just wanted to point out the fact that I've been surprised that I have seen some some haters, like more haters than I actually thought I would see. So that that's the one thing I want to point out. Yeah. So as Mike mentioned, um, we've got a, a phone line, the Necrophone, and you can reach us at nine zero eight nine one three zero seven eight two. That's 908-913-0782. So drop us a line. Give us some recommendations. Just say hello. It's all welcome. So uh, we got a message from uh, Mike from Pennsylvania. Just uh, mm -hmm. basically to say hello and uh, happy 4th of July. And right, yeah. back, right back at you, bro. I hope you're doing well. Yes, and, um, you know, we'll, we'll be in touch, man, for sure. But yeah. our, our proper call came from Noble. And uh, this is Noble. Hey, Mike. Uh, my name's Noble. I'm calling from BFE, Texas. Relocated out here uh, a couple years ago and uh, found your podcast, uh, your mini podcast. And uh, honestly, uh, they have been a godsend. I uh, just wanted to give you guys a call, say keep up what you're doing. Keep up the Lord's work. Um, I just wanted to share some things I thought you you may be into. Uh, there's a podcast called 4AD Forages, like 4AD, the music label. Um, anyways, the first episode is basically all about Roland S. Howard by uh, two people that, like, possibly knew him the best. Thought you might be into that. Uh, I believe I've heard you mention your uh, admiration of Roland F. Howard. Also, uh, recently came across a band called The Vision Bleak. I guess they've been doing it since the early 2000s, but they're a duo from Germany, and they do like, I mean, their music kind of is like definitely gothy. I would say there is like, doom in there there's like death rock definitely uh the guy the way he sings reminds me of nick cave at times you know not as freaking awesome as nick cave but anyways they got an album called weird tales and they have like a a cd hardcover book edition that actually is a book with like weird tales and i know that's your jam so anyways Love what you guys are doing. I'll keep listening. You keep doing it. Catch you later. Bye. Yeah, thanks for the kind words, dude. Uh, yeah, man. Yeah, four AD forges. That sounds incredible, man. Like, cause I'm I'm like a massive Roland Howard fan, and he's a big favorite of mine. And uh, I admire his work of the late Roland Howard. His solo material, the stuff he did in the birthday party, uh, Boys Next Door. Uh, the guy's been like a, a you know very very prolific uh, artist and was taken away from us sadly you know years ago like uh, at least ten over ten years ago I think he passed so mm. yeah and uh, uh, as I was listening to the caller I thought of two things I thought of uh, Jeff who also lives in Texas and I thought of you because uh, he 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 kind of pushed all the Mike Hill buttons on the uh, on the, his descriptions <laughs> so yeah yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, vision you know, bleak. I, 
the the vision bleak. I have to check with Ralph on that. But if they have a record called Weird Tales, then I think I'm uh, I'm already halfway in. You know, that's right. Yeah, yeah. You, you could be a big fan with without even having heard a note. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that happens. Like you, I'll hear about a band, and I'll hear about kind of what they're about or whatever, or maybe some song titles or some song subjects, and I'm like, okay, I'm half in. You know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm, I'm buying the T-shirt. You know. But uh, so that, yeah. So that brings us to uh, this week's feature film. We're going big, old school, classic summer horror. With yes. The feature from the Black Lagoon. That's right. Uh, this is, I don't know if it's our, hell, is it our first universal monster movie? I don't think so. Is it? Or a guy? No, we did, um, we did, Bri we did, Bri we did, we did, Bri Bri yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. But this is our first proper universal horror in ages and uh i'm very excited to do this one this was a mike scandato suggestion because i felt uh creech as i lovingly refer to him as is uh is a nice you know one of the few summertime horror universal guys w would you say so i agree it takes place in uh in a tropical climate um, that's right you know it's uh <laughs> It's not based on any any liter any literary character, you know. No, which is, I think it's there's no it's not like a Mary Shelley or a Bram Stoker, you know, character. Um, it's pretty much a creation of the Universal Studios. Yeah, and you know what? The really interesting thing about this, right out of the gate, is that this is from '54, so it it comes. Way after Dracula and Frankenstein and the Wolfman. And I feel like this is the movie that all of the major horror players, sci-fi players, got to see in the theater, Mike, and made the a really big impact on, you know? Uh, like, this is a movie from the, the childhoods of, say, your Spielbergs and your Carpenters. You know what I'm saying? Like, they, you know... They were too young to say to maybe have seen Dracula in the theater. That was like the 30s or or, or Frankenstein in the 40s. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, creature yeah, I, is I, almost I agree. like the yeah creature is like the like that modern universal kickoff, right? Being 54, I could see that. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely on the tail end, of, you know, towards the the latter part of that era. Um, yeah, you know, so yeah, so the movie's only 80 minutes long, it's short. Mm -hmm. It's uh, premiered February 12th, 1954. And then Mar I, I thought this was interesting. March 5th, 1954, regional openings, meaning to me, drive-ins. I'm sure this thing right. was a huge drive-in, drive-in mm -hmm. type of film. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, again, I think this, I mean, Jesus, uh, just based on, on the special effects and the way it looked and the way it was shot, I mean, I, I imagine this just had quite an impact on of course not just future filmmakers and horror fans but like uh, on everybody because it, it was actually a huge hit so yeah totally well you know since we're talking about impact and influences and things like that you know let's let's you know of course some of the more notable uh you know the shape of water you know mm -hmm. that film that came out a few years ago uh, gabe sapien the mike Mignola, yep. uh you know mm -hmm. character and in a weird oh. way like a perverse version of this is humanoids from the deep. You ever see that? Oh, of course. Yeah. Look, yeah. I don't. I don't think like Alien and Jaws happen without this movie in a weird way. Like you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah. this is like the ground zero for like so much, and it was just like decades ahead with it, its special effects. And, you know, honestly, it, it's kind of important to to make note of the special effects, I feel like, right out of the gate. Um, it was designed by a woman, uh, Millicent Patrick, the, uh, you know, created the, the, the look and the makeup for the creature from the Black Lagoon. But sadly, uh, a man took credit for it for decades. Oh, man. Uh, Bud Westmore. Yeah, Bud Westmore who his family was like a, a big, you know, makeup family in Hollywood for many, many years. And Bud Westmore was 
he was a makeup artist himself, uh, but he was also like the head of the makeup department at Universal at the time. And motherfucker insisted that his name was in the credits for Creature, you know, for, for Creature from the Black Lagoon, the Gilman. But the actual reality was that it was uh, Millicent Patrick, who was a Disney animator. They completely downplayed her role. But she did, of course, eventually get her comeuppance. And, uh, you know, everyone now knows that it was her who created the creature. Uh, she lived until she was 82, passed away February 24th, 1998. So, yeah, I mean, look, early 50s Hollywood, I imagine something like this uh, was uh, par for the course, you know, probably happened all the time. Yeah, it's pretty lousy, if you ask me. Hmm. But, yeah, that's that, that oh, probably oh, was was pretty much the uh, the way things went back then. So let's uh, just run through the cast real quick. We have um, Richard Carlson as Dr. David Reed. Julia, the lovely Julia Adams as Kay. Yep. Richard Denning as uh, Dr. Mark Williams. Antonio Moreno as Dr. Carl Maya. Nestor Paiva, Paiva, Paiva as uh, <laughs> Captain Lucas. Yep. And then there's a couple of uh, stunt people here that I just want to mention, too. We have um, Rick, Rick U. Browning as uh, the creature in the underwater scenes. Ben yep, Chapman. Rico Browning, yeah. Yep. Ben Chapman as uh, the creature on the land. And then uh, Ginger Stanley as the swimming K. You know, it's so funny that they, they list Ginger Stanley as the swimming K because – it took me all of about uh, five seconds to realize that that was not uh, Julia Adams uh, once uh, she hit the water. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, like they didn't really they didn't really do like that great of a job of making her look like uh, Julia Adams. Yeah. You, you know, I kind of saw that right away. Um, yeah. It was far. I even pointed out the style. I went, look, there's a completely different woman. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yeah, it's interesting that they that they had to credit Ginger Stanley, because honestly, I mean, her swimming was fucking pretty amazing too. Aside from Rico Browning swimming, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she has a nice uh, Wikipedia entry. Of, she was a blonde. Yeah, I almost feel like I, I saw the blonde hair uh, at one point in the movie as well. So that's kind of funny. But uh, yeah, after I watched the movie, I I I was so kind of taken by Julia Adams. You know, kind of crushing on her. She was a beautiful woman. I I, I looked up on eBay what a uh, a signed eight by ten of hers would be and i, I kind of have one in, in my cart as we speak um what really sucks i have to say this uh, our listeners who go to the horror cons i'm going to give you some advice to take with you for the rest of your days and that is don't wait to get autographs of people that you want to get autographs of because i had the chance to get not only julia adams autograph at chiller one year i could have also got ben chapman's and Rico Brownings. So all three of them could be in my collection. But alas, at the time, I was like, oh, well, you know, I'll get them another time. But oh, there was no. no other time. They're no longer with us. So oh, I, I missed out on all three of them, like, which kind of sucks. Yeah, because all of them did chiller over the years, which is, uh, you know, the big convention in Jersey that I've mentioned many times. A lot of people go to it. So, yes, get the autograph. That's my piece of advice, Mike Hill. That's good advice. Mm -hmm. Yes, don't wait. Uh, but yeah, this was a lot of fun to watch for the first time again in a minute. I, of course, I've seen the movie. I, I own a really nice Blu-ray, actually. Um, about five years ago, Alex Ross, the the you know comic book artist, painter, did a series of all the Universal monsters, uh, you know, paintings, and he also did these nice Blu-rays. Uh, these like metal tins and I was able to acquire all of them. Oh, wow. So I have, uh, yeah, I have a uh, creature bride, Dracula, Frankenstein, invisible man, wolf man, and mummy. So I have all seven and, uh, I believe they all fetch for a nice penny on the secondary market. So I was glad I picked these up. Uh, Blu-ray looked fucking beautiful, man. Um, I, I understand you, you watched it on uh prime. Yes. I, I, I rented it cause I don't have a physical copy of this movie. Hmm. Yeah, but it's you know, it looked, well, well worth it. it. It looked good. You know, it's yeah. um actually I rented it on Apple, not Prime. And um Apple, oh okay. Gen generally Apple Apple streaming stuff looks good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's been re remastered. 
uh yeah this this blu-ray looked like beautiful um and you know if, if you can if you can grab a copy of it i i feel like it is available on blu-ray just maybe not with this alex ross cover obviously but i, I believe all the universal monsters are, are readily available but they're not super read available readily available on streamers without having to pay that extra price you notice that yeah, but it's it's pretty affordable. I think it was only like three three or four dollars or something like that to rent it. It wasn't like you know, in, insane. It's worth it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like that's like what a couple. That's less than what a couple coffee costs these days in some places. To be honest, that's true. Like the three ninety nine rental or the four ninety nine rental is essentially less than a a Starbucks. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can yeah. Argue. This is so true. It's definitely worth it. Yeah. Um, but it's weird though. I I I believe you know Universal. I believe is part of NBC Universal. So I almost thought that the whole slew of them would be on Peacock, but they are not. Maybe they will be at like Halloween time or something, right? Who knows? Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Yep. So this, what I particularly liked about this is um, this this character is that mm -hmm. it also mines that sort of area that Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, you know, the kind of missing link, you know, angle. Yeah. Like, um, there's also something vaguely Lovecraftian about uh, about the the creature from the Black Lagoon as well. You yes, know, there is like part part of like this elder race of creatures that we thought were extinct, but you know they're hidden, if they're obscured in some remote area. You know that so that that's why that's another reason why I really dug uh, creature from the Black Lagoon. It's just the the concept of it, you know, because. You know, there's the scientists going into the Amazon, you know, so there's mm -hmm. that's like, um, you know, it's almost like Mountains of Madness kind of thing where they're investigating something, you know, and they find this thing because there's, you know, their their curiosity is peaked when they find like a skeletal hand, you know, and it has these like webbed. That looks pretty sick, actually, the hand. Yes. Now, here's the question right out of the gate about that. Does this mean there's another one? Yes, that's what I was going to bring right. up. Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah, the implication is that there's there was all there is a whole race of these things. I would imagine, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and that he's just yeah. one of many creatures. A a piscine or piscine amphibious humanoid, as that he's referred to on the uh, Wikipedia description, in the waters of the Amazon. Uh, of course, uh, in the title, he's referred to as the creature. They also refer to him as the Gill Man. And in, in modern parlance, I affectionately refer to him as Creech. Um, yeah, I mean, this it, it, it's always a lot of fun. I mean, right out of the gate, it has that kind of cool beginning where it, it, it kind of like teases about where it might have came from, like this kind of ancient civilization, you know, from, from like, you know, long ago that, that has been living in this, you know, Black Lagoon area area of the Amazon for ages. And it, it's also got like that vibe of like, man, like he's the like the good guy. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, essentially, yeah. I feel like he, he is the good guy because all he's doing is just kind of living his life, you know? In yeah, the lagoon. And, the, and the humans are like the interlopers, you know what I mean? Yes. And that's like, yeah, so it plays in that, that whole angle of it as well, where he's just doing his thing. He's like a creature, you know, he's like a part of like a, the missing link between the land and the sea is amphibious and he's uh out there on his own living his creature life and then these scientists come and bother him basically and that's the, totally you know, and and one could argue the the jaws parallel of like well you know yeah of course at the beginning of the movie jaws killed that girl but jaws killed that girl because he was hungry yeah. <laughs> like jaws jaws essentially yeah he was like a menace and he was killing people but he was just acting like a shark. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, um, exactly. And, and also speaking of Jaws, I caught a, 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 a camera angle, like a moment in this movie that I think came that Jaws completely might have aped. Um, it, it, in the early beginning of Jaws, when that, that blonde haired girl is swimming, there's this really great, you know, camera shot, like, of you know, they're like below her. And th there was a very similar moment where, uh, you know, what's her name? Uh, Kay, played by Julia Adams, is swimming. I thought it kind of was like, okay, I have a funny feeling Spielberg might, might have liked that little moment. I, I I almost wanted to kind of jot down at what point in the movie it was. But if you know the movie, maybe you know the moment I'm talking about. But again, um, 
I just think it was probably extremely uh, influential. Uh, the other interesting thing is upon its release, it actually was a 3D movie initially. Uh, there was this big 3D explosion uh, in the 50s that kind of came and went pretty fast. But uh, Creature of the Black Lagoon was shown in 3D at a bunch of theaters and then reissued uh, in 1975 in theaters in 3D uh, once again. So, yeah, that must have been fun back then, huh? Yeah, this, this is probably would, would look pretty cool on a 3D film, like on a screen, like in a big, big theater, you know? Oh, yeah, totally. But, um, yeah, it, it's funny. As, also, as I was watching it, I was getting like these, these like mild cannibal Holocaust vibes in the Amazon jungle. Oh, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> yeah, that, the, the Amazon will always make me think of uh, cannibal Holocaust and the tro oh, various yeah. atrocities. Yeah. Yes, yes. Although this is, you know, way more family friendly, let's just say. Um, and uh, I, I love that, the, the you know, the boat's name is the, is Rita, you know, and, and I, again, it's just all these like little things I kind of picked up as I was watching how I felt like, you know, maybe some of the, the young directorial greats of like the 70s and 80s kind of like probably love the hell out of this movie. I don't know. I, that kind of kept playing in my head. Yeah, you know, and and also uh, the fact that the creature is, you know, there's the love interest between creature, the creature and K too. Where, mm -hmm. You know, it's um, yes, you know, he's he's human emotions, you know, and mm -hmm. he has a, you know the the whole romantic loner aspect of the creature too is played up in the film. Yeah, every man he comes across, he kind of wants to kill, and yeah. he, he okay. there's about four or five people in this movie. But he certainly at no point seems to want to kill Kay. Uh, he's kind of trying to take it, a, you know, run away with him, actually. Uh, of course, she's horrified by him. By him and, you know, uh, again, a, a amazing special effects job all around. I mean, for 1954, this kind of like probably raised the banner, would you say, at the very least? I think it still looks great, you know, in black oh, and white, yeah. you know. It's, you know um probably you know multi hours to put that damn thing on and take it off it's just you know again i almost feel like it's just like the birth of like the, the modern horror monster like the modern one you know we also have some uh very uh unapologetic uh brown face in in this movie too <laughs> yes yes we do alas it is 1954 and uh hollywood and society have not uh have not evolved, Michael. Not just yet. Not just yet. You know, it'll take some more time for that. Uh, but again, you gotta you gotta look past it. It's it's of its era, right, Mike? Yeah, it's just part of that part of that world, which uh, you know, I imagine like someone who um is more is a little bit younger might look at this film and be like, you know what? Uh I think I'll look into canceling this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Although I, although nothing surprises me in the slightest anymore, a a cancel <laughs> creature from the Black Lagoon, I would have to, I would, I would counter picket the canceling well, of creature from you the know, Black Lagoon. Uh, under certain, you know, certain perspectives, you'll have uh, exploitation, you know, vic victimization. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. you got this like uh, humanoid rapist, like sub, you know, yep. amphibious rapist, like wandering. Oh the, my the, god! This, yeah, so that you know. <laughs> I don't the want to give anyone. Mm. I don't want to give anyone any bad ideas. But yeah, no, that's... please leave the movie alone. Leave Creech yep. alone. I get a leave yeah. Creech alone shirt. Um, <laughs> honestly, it's it's not even that bad if you if you probably put it up against some other movies of its time, and of course before its time and a little after its time. So it, it's not even all that that terrible. Um. So yeah, we've got a bunch of scientists on an expedition in the Amazon aboard the Rita. You know, one of those kind of old school tugboats. I don't know. I don't know if a tugboat is the right yeah, word like for it. You know. Like a river river boat, you know, and you got the the crusty uh, you know, Captain Lucas, you know, he's like the uh your quintessential river boat captain, you know. Mm -hmm. Rough around the edges. And uh we we've got uh you know, Julia Adams, of course, playing Kay Lawrence. Uh, Richard Carlson plays her her love interest, uh, Dr. David Reed. 
And then we've got another uh, doctor in the mix, uh, Dr. Mark Lawrence, played by Richard Denning, who I think is trying to muscle in on the gal. Well, you know, what, yeah. what do you think there? Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, I, I picked up on that vibe as well. He's trying to, he trying to muscle trying in. trying to muscle in. Uh, you know, uh, a, a Poughkeepsie native, actually, uh, Richard Denning from oh. a good old Poughkeepsie. How about that? Yeah, yeah. Not too far um, from where I grew up. No, no. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of like the kind of the the, the, the kind of back and forth between these two guys, you know, over the over the lady. Although Kay is obviously with uh, David, she's not really even trying to really super entertain Mark, in my opinion. But you know, Mark has his little quips here and there, and then of course th there's a bit of a there's a brawl towards the end of the movie, which I thought was fun. They, they throw down. Also, there's that awesome like fifties way of speaking in this film you know yes <laughs> <laughs> which is like yeah see it's like, yeah there's definitely it's like, a lot of that <laughs> do you think people actually spoke like that back then or was it a like a, a movie thing no i think people spoke like that back then oh no yeah i mean they were they were you know they were like modern doctor dudes you know put in the situation i think i think all all three of them were kind of people of their of their 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 day you know and i think julia adams was probably a good example of you know a, a 1954 attractive woman you no know? yeah you know you, you could also frame this movie as like man against nature kind of type of film you know yes you definitely yeah, cause, could because you know the creature is not supernatural the creature no. is uh is a part of the natural world and um you know, even, not you know, even a, to, he's not a monster in a no, way. I mean, he's, he's a, a monster, monster but he's not a monster, right? Hmm. I mean, he's he's no more the, a monster than the shark in Jaws is, you know? Right. Yes. Very and good. You could even say that he's less of a monster because he actually has emotions and is there's motivations to what he does, and it, none of it is really evil. You know, hmm. I mean, if you think about it, he's in his habitat, and he's like these like uh, white guys from. Uh, <laughs> you know north america come down into, into the amazon and are uh you know basically invading his territory right so he has it's within his uh his his uh code i imagine to take them out so i don't i don't really see him acting out in and in, in doing any evil you know true and it's interesting how he's you know the gill man i mean his his makeup i mean he, he the the legs and arms like he he is x percentage a man in a way right it's it's yeah. like this kind of man fish hybrid really you know we, that, that's kind of the best way to describe him um i mean he, he and it when he swims obviously you know uh rico browning was was a professional swimmer and stuntman and um it, it's really interesting it's like he he kind of obviously he swims like a man because it's a, it's a man in a costume, but it, it gives like this kind of extra life to him that is not the land version of the creature. The land version of the creature is ooh, maybe rather stiff, you know. Uh, but it, in the sea, it's like you know he's kind of like lightning Aquaman in a way, you know. And that kind of makes sense too if you think that mostly he's he's a sea creature, you know, mm -hmm. and it's even though though he can breathe air. You know, he's yeah. more accustomed to being underwater. So it's it's a little bit more labored for him to be above, out of the water, on the land. Very true. Very true. Um, so as I said, we have two people uh, playing the monster, and, and Ben Chapman portrayed him, you know, on land. Uh, those scenes were actually shot uh, in Universal City, California. Uh, but a lot of the water scenes were the underwater scenes were shot in Florida at Walcala Springs, Florida. So we have a, a Florida, California mix going on. Uh, I don't have the budget for the movie. I imagine it probably cost a pretty penny for 1954. No. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. With the, you know, the you know, the makeup effects and that kind of thing, for sure. And then travel, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um. But it lists a box office at 1.3 million, which again in 1954 money is is pretty Big damn money. amazing. Yeah. Um, it, it's a smash success. But I would gather it's probably way more than that at this point. But you know, 
if that's what it made, say, in its 50s run, that's unbelievable, actually. That's great. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, the only hang-up I had with the movie was I wanted to know. I've mm-hmm. always had this this question about it, how can he just be the only one? You know, so there clearly has to be other people, other gill men like him. Very true. And I'm surprised they didn't tease that a little more other than the fact that they showed at the very beginning, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of hand, like the, the old kind of claw, you know? Um, however, there is a sequel. There's two sequels. There's, you know, Re- Revenge of the Creature and Creature Walks Among Us. Um, I have never fucked with the sequels, and I am going to fix that this week. Because I am not sure if in the sequel, the creature is playing that same monster. But I actually, I, I, I'm i going to just check it right now live, live on the air, folks. So, yes, as a matter of fact, Revenge of the Creature, it is the same monster. Because right after, or out of the gate, it says, having previously survived being riddled with bullets, the Gill Man is captured and sent to Ocean Harbor Oceanarium in Florida. So, yeah, so Revenge of the Creature actually does go to florida and it is the same creature um i think that's a missed opportunity not having say a multitude of creatures but i imagine they probably could not pull that off maybe on the effects side or i mean who knows right yeah you know and and that's that's like the thing like i never saw any of the sequels either and i I probably Mm -hmm. will watch them now now that we're talking and, about uh, yeah the creature walks among us which is the third one yes it is the same creature uh it's it's all it's 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 a it's a real deal trilogy so yeah i gotta watch those other two uh shame on me for having not seen the two follow-ups uh but yeah i i don't know i mean i imagine they probably wanted to, to focus on the one of course the title of the movie being creature from the black lagoon but yeah maybe a bit of a of a wasted uh opportunity there to explore like a whole bevy of them which would be insane yeah. uh which i think might you know happen if they ever remake the movie uh speaking of remakes of the movie um i need to rattle off the attempted remakes of this movie <laughs> uh the very first one goes back to 1982 with john landis uh didn't happen because they didn't want it to clash with the jaws 3d that was coming out that year so didn't happen in 82 1992 why it's john carpenter developing Mm. the remake of creature from the black lagoon uh never got the green light at universal uh 1995 offered to peter jackson he instead chooses to go to king kong that's three folks we're about to hit number four 1996 ivan reitman wants to do it does not materialize 1999, after the success of The Mummy, uh, director Gary Ross signs on to remake the movie. The movie does not happen. Cut to 2002. Guillermo del Toro is going to make a remake and then no, decides to pass on it and then eventually does The Shape of Water, which is extremely Creature from the Black Lagoon-esque, you could say. Cut to 2000. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. But wait, there's more. 2005 they have yet another director again does not materialize 2007 again does not materialize 2009 does not materialize the final goes to 2012 where apparently universal announced back then that there was one in pre-production nope doesn't happen gets canceled uh Again, they bring up that the closest to it is probably the 2017 film, The Shape of Water, inspired by Guillermo del Toro's childhood memories of Creature from the Black Lagoon. So, my God, the attempts at this movie. I mean, maybe that means it's it shouldn't be remade. I mean, what is there, eight attempts at this movie? It's crazy. But you know what? I kind of feel like I would like to see a remake of it. You know, it's just or, or a re, re, you know, I... I you know just a visualization of it like a different take on it or something. I mean I don't think this if they ever did remake it I think they should take a lot of license with the story because yeah you know that story's good but it, it they did it and it works but they should 
I like the idea of it, the missing link idea, you know, where there's yeah, like, yeah. like a, a, like a whole race of these things living in obscurity somewhere in some remote part of the world, you know, and they like, there's all sorts of deep sea creatures that you never, that they're just discovering now. So why not have an intelligent amphibian that is really good at concealing itself, you know, and it could be even have some sort of like Bigfoot vibes too, or some people, oh, you know, that the, we've seen the legend, you know, there's hearsay of these creatures, you know, or, or some very dim grainy photographs or something. And that's how this, they start researching it, you know, and then, okay, cool. There's a, there's a, yeah. whole, you know, and go from there. I think it's bonkers, Mike, that, uh, that there is no, remake you know in the works because if you really think about it i almost think this is the most remakeable one in 2024 like this is like this story and the look and the vibe like i i feel like it's something that could probably connect with a, a 20 something more than say dracula again frankenstein yeah, again yeah. a werewolf again um you know this is like this cool sea creature and it's like you know what i'm saying i mean there's so much that can be done with a new story and maybe a new plot, but just a, a similar looking creature and definitely having all this under great underwater stuff. I mean, look where we are with special effects now. I mean, I, it could be a fantastic movie, but for some reason, after some eight attempts has never really materialized. Um, I kind of want to rewatch uh, The Shape of Water again. I, re I really like that movie actually. And obviously you could tell it was, you know, Creature from the Black Lagoon-esque, right? Yeah, I was a big, uh, big fan of that. I, I really enjoyed it. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, maybe not every universal thing uh, translates so well. I mean, but hey, look at The Invisible Man. That movie was a huge success. And then apparently they were going to do all this other cool shit after it. And, and nothing ever happened there. Maybe, uh, maybe this... These universal people, I don't know. Maybe it's their fault. Who the fuck knows? Yeah, it's hard to say. Hard to say. Hard to say. But yes, many potential uh, attempts at, at Creech that just never came to fruition. Um, I don't know if we need to go beat by beat for this entire movie. Uh, I think a lot of people have seen it. If you have not seen it, shame on you. But uh, we, we could talk a little bit about the ending. The ending was uh, was uh, was a bummer for me, Michael. It was a de depressing. What about you? Yeah, it's like the uh, they 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 end up shooting this this poor guy, you know. And his these guys, like I said, these these invaders come and they uh, you know, they take him out. They riddle him with bullets. And that's why it seems to me unlikely that there would be a re there would have been a sequel to this film because he was clearly <laughs> uh, dead at the end of it, you know. But here's the thing: they sh they they shoot him, you know, with like shotguns a bunch of times, and. Uh, the, the Dr. David, uh, the main meet, lead, uh, David Reed, I'm sorry, uh, tells him, you know, stop shooting, whatever, even though he's killed, you know, about five of the men at this point. Uh, and he just kind of slowly walks out into the lagoon and goes underwater and swims a bit. And he's like swim struggling and it's kind of sad. And then all of a sudden he kind of stops swimming and just like floats. And he does look pretty dead. And the movie ends. But the movie again was such a rousing success that they they kind of demanded a sequel, uh, and thus we got you know Re Revenge of the Creature, where it turns out he 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 did live, and, and they were able to grab him out of that water and they brought him down to Florida. To me, that sounds pretty cool. Where I believe he runs amok down there, so I'm actually looking forward to seeing what goes on uh, in, in the sequel. But yeah, kind of this downer ending where I guess you spent the next year or so as a fan of the movie. We're like, oh man, yeah, they killed the creature at the end, you know. And then you probably saw the newspaper ad. Oh shit, there's a part two. There's a sequel, you know. That must have been fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I gotta watch. There's, there's two. You were saying there's three. So yeah, there's three, yeah, there's, three total uh, films. Okay. Three. There's a trilogy: Revenge of the Creature, a year later in '55, and Creature Walks Among Us in '56. So they banged out three movies in, within the three years: '54, '55, and '56. Um. I bet the other ones are a lot of fun. Uh, from what I understand, they're not as good as the original because, well, nothing is as good as the original with the exception of, you know, The Godfather and maybe a few others. But, 
for creature movies, I, I, I bet they're a good time. Um, you know, as I said, this movie, you know, w- was a big success and it is critically acclaimed and, you know, archetypal 50s monster movie that has been copied so often that some of the edge of it is gone, but still entertaining, said Leonard Maltin. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes has an 80% approval rating based on 44 reviews. That should be much higher. Fuck you, Rotten Tomatoes users. Uh, yeah, then it talks about the sequels and the cultural impact of Creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, yeah, I mean, look, in my apartment alone, I've got about, uh, I don't know, 10 different Creature from the Black Lagoon things going on. I'm a huge fan, you know? Uh I feel like he's a creature that really resonates with people and, and definitely resonates uh, currently, you know? W- would you agree? I feel like there's a lot of love for the creature. Yeah, definitely, you know? And like I said, it's manifested itself in so many other films, you know? And, mm-hmm. you know, there, there's, like I was saying earlier, there's the great uh, Humanoids from the Deep, which is like a very adult version of the story, um, except that humanoids aren't necessarily uh, part of the natural world in that one. Yeah. Sorry, there's a, a very loud ice cream truck that passed by, hoping it doesn't park in front of my window. As of right now, <laughs> it is right in front of my window, and it is really loud. Let's see if it keeps going. But, uh, yeah, I love Creech. I'm very, it's very difficult for me to pick my favorite universal creature, honestly, like my favorite universal monster. It's almost impossible, but he is up there. Like he's, he's, I guess he's like a top three, man. You know, love him. Yeah. He, uh, my he's, my number, he, <laughs> he's my number two. He's my he's number, number two. two. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah nice. Dracula is my number one. Ah, okay. See, I kind of fluctuate with Dracula and Frankenstein. I actually really like Frankenstein. Hold on. I'm going to go into another room because the truck is killing me. <laughs> life in new york city in the summer good lord um which brings us to the moment of truth i would say what would you give the classic creature from the black lagoon on our scale of one to five? Oh yeah this this easily gets a five out of five for me yeah totally i kind of i kind of figured it would i mean it's an essential movie i feel like an essential horror movie uh, one one of the great '50s horror movies, and just you know, universal must. If if for whatever reason you haven't seen it, and I imagine maybe some of the younger listeners have not seen it, please uh, fix it and see it immediately. Right, Mike? I agree. I think you should go out, and if you haven't seen this thing, it's uh, you're missing out. Shame on you. <laughs> Shame. Shame on you is right. Yeah, yeah and I think we'll, we'll do some more. Uh, some more universals this year. I would like to, you know. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? You know what? I would like to do some uh, giant bug movies too. If you're down. Oh, okay. I'm down yeah. with that. Yeah, like um, them, you know, something mm, like that. Okay, I haven't seen that shit in a long time. Oh yeah. I noticed uh, some of the '70s uh, jams are coming out on Blu-rays, like Empire of the Ants reissue oh, yeah. and yep. uh, Food of the Gods reissue, and. Uh, Man, Food of the Gods, that's a fucking movie that needs a remake and would probably be a, a an insane remake, but uh, that hasn't happened yet either. Yeah, I think uh, that that whole, uh, you know, sort of, we touched on earlier, man against nature, or nature against man, rather, like those types of films, I think are really interesting. Oh, totally, totally. But like that really downer ending where the, the, the food of the gods is now in the, the, the food supply of the children and the yeah. movie just ends. I mean, insane. I always thought that was the creepiest ending. The movie itself is not very good, but no. that ending is very good. Yeah, the concept <laughs> the concept is good. Yeah, the concept is good, but it's very cheap and hokey and they killed a lot of real rats in it. And it's kind of a kind of a hot mess. The movie has some nice moments, food of the gods, but. Definitely ripe for remake, in my opinion. All right. Well, there, that, well, there you have it, guys. It up, yeah. Man. So um, I hope everyone's enjoying their summer, and uh, we'll talk to you uh, next week. Yes, we will see you all next time. Take care, everybody. Bye.